open. Thank you. You may be seated. Our responsive reading for today, excuse me, our scripture reading for today is out of the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 6. I'll be reading verses 1 through 6. The text today is verses 4 and 6, but we'll be reading verses 1 through 6. Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. God's word for his people. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. And I have established my covenant with them, to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Amen. missionary moment for today comes to us from India, from the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions. Please continue in prayer for Mr. M.J. Epen as Satan seeks to destroy the work in which he is engaged. Knowing that the gospel cannot be chained, Mr. Epen continues to freely proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ in spite of the tremendous opposition that he is facing. He was thankful for a two-month visit from his daughter, Vinci. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you are causing your servants, men and women who know Jesus Christ, to carry the gospel of our Lord and Savior around the world. And Father, we thank you for the work in India. We thank you for the work of M.J. Epen. We thank you, Father, that he is unashamed of the testimony of Christ 
and that in spite of opposition from Muslims, opposition from Hindus, opposition from those who oppose the gospel, both in high places in government and those who are rabble-rousers in the community, we thank you, Father, that he is unashamed and he continues to proclaim the truth. We pray, Father, for your watch, care, and protection over him and over his family. We thank you, Father, for his humble testimony and the truth of the scriptures that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Father, we pray that you will take by your spirit the word of God and reach deep into the hearts of those who have heard and irresistibly draw them to Christ. We thank you, Father, for this visit that he has from his daughter, Vincy, and we pray for your watch, care, and protection over her. Father, we pray that the gospel will have free course in her life and through her and through many others as well. We thank you for the independent board and we thank you for the work that they are doing through many missionaries on the foreign field. Father, we pray for your blessings upon the upcoming presbytery. We thank you that the men of the presbytery will be gathering here, some from far, far away from South America, from Central America, from western part of the United States. Father, we thank you that they are coming all over that they might gather together and encourage one another here in this place. We pray for your watch, care, and protection over them as they travel. We pray, Father, that you will fill their families with joy and gladness, that you will make provision for them financially, that you will meet their needs in every way, grant them good health and strength. How we thank you, Father, for this answer to prayer that little baby Jean-Baptiste Durand is doing so much better, and we pray for his continued growth and strength. Father, we pray for your special mercies upon Lois Curran today in the hospital. We pray that you will give the doctors wisdom and skill in caring for her, and we pray that you would heal her leg completely. We pray, Father, that you would relieve her from this problem that she's been having with Lyme disease for so many years, which has affected her nervous system and causes her falls. We pray that you would heal her from that. Father, we pray for your special mercies and encouragement to the family of Mary Willits in her home going this past week. We pray, Father, that as her funeral occurs and perhaps unsaved family members or unsaved friends will be attending, that they might hear the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed clearly and articulately, and that you would draw them to Christ. Father, we pray for your mercies upon the family of Stanley Hanna. And Father, we thank you for the many years of testimony that he had here in this church, and we pray that you will give those who are left behind the courage and wisdom to continue in the faith. We pray, Father, for your hand of healing on Don Hoyle after his terrible motorcycle accident. We pray that you would raise him back up to full health and strength. Father, we pray for those who are here with financial difficulties. We pray that you would meet their needs, that you would provide for them in marvelous and miraculous ways above and beyond the human realm. For those who are facing physical difficulties, those who perhaps have problems that they've not shared with this congregation, you know the need, Father, and we pray that you will answer in a way that gives the greatest glory to Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for those who have unsaved family members, those to whom perhaps they have witnessed for many years, and yet who have not yet trusted Christ, who have not yet realized that he is the only way, the only truth, and the only life, the only hope of heaven, the only way to come to the Father. Father, we pray for those unsaved loved ones, unsaved friends, those who know the truth, but who have refused it. We pray, Father, that you will break down whatever barricade is there, show them the foolishness of their resistance to you as the sovereign God, cause them to understand that someday, whether they like it or not, they will stand before you, and they will give an account of what they've done with Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for their salvation. We pray, Father, for our country, for those whom, in your wisdom, you have put in authority over us. We pray for their salvation. We pray for their spiritual growth. We pray that you would give them a Christian worldview. We pray that you would give them courage to live the gospel as well as believe it in their hearts, so that we as believers might lead quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and in honesty. We pray, Father, for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for Israel as it goes through this crisis war with Hamas. How we thank you for the great and precious promises of your word that you are the God of national Israel as well as the God of all creation. And that Israel and Jerusalem is in the center of your heart and the apple of your eye. And those who touch her will face your wrath. 
Father, we pray for your blessing and protection over the believers who are there, who this day are sharing Christ, both with Jews and with Arabs, and with any who else will listen. We pray for your protection over them and that you would make them articulate in their faith and the expression of the word of God, that they might preach those passages of scripture which are necessary for the hearers this day. We pray that you will meet their needs in every way and protect their families. Father, now we come before you in worship. We pray that you will calm and still our hearts. That we will understand that there is no mistake in bringing us here to this place today. No mistake about those who are listening in on the internet. Your sovereign hand has directed it. And Father, we pray that our hearts and minds will be open to your word. That as your word is proclaimed, Jesus Christ might have the preeminence. For he is our King of kings and Lord of lords. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. He is the one who loved us and who bought us with his blood. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As our ushers are coming forward this morning to receive our morning tithes and gifts and offerings, we're once again reminded of the great truth of the gospel that salvation is a free gift. You are not buying your salvation when you donate money to the church. Jesus Christ paid in full on the cross. That's why he said, it is finished. Nothing can be added to it, nothing can be subtracted from it, nothing about it can be changed, it cannot be diminished or augmented. It is finished! The reason we give is because it is finished. God showed his love to us and we respond in love by the way in which we give. And as we give back a portion of that which he has so generously entrusted to our care, may it be for the glory of Christ and for the spread of the gospel. For we pray in Jesus' name. Father, thank you so much for this privilege of giving. And Father, we pray that you will help each one of us so to give as unto Jesus Christ not for merely our personal benefit, not to impress other people around us, not so that somehow we can manipulate and shoehorn God into doing what we want him to do, but because we're thankful. Gifts of thanksgiving, gifts of praise, gifts of love from hearts filled with love. And so, Father, we commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own heart we give thee. Amen. Please remain standing and take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 327, 327. The Old Rugged Cross, number 327.
you may be seated. The old rugged cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Someday we exchange it for a crown. And meanwhile, we have responsibilities, we have work to do. We have service to fulfill, we have obligations that God has called upon us and has placed on our shoulders responsibilities for sharing the gospel of Christ with those who have never heard. Before we begin the sermon today, let's join in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for the cross of Christ. Keep our eyes always focused upon him. Cause us to see Jesus Christ crucified, risen, and coming again. How we thank you for the great and precious promises of your word. That we serve not a dead Savior, but a risen Savior. Not merely a relic of history, but one who is alive and who will come again for his bride, the church, who will fulfill, fulfill the great and precious promises of Scripture concerning Israel as a nation, concerning, sadly, the time of tribulation, and gladly, the time of the millennium. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray for your blessing as we look today again at the covenant of the land, the promised land which you have given to Israel as a nation, which you guarantee to her. And Father, we pray that you will bless our hearts as we see you keeping promises to Israel lets us know that you will keep promises to us. And so, Father, we commit this message to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we look at the covenant and the land, part number seven. That portion of scripture that we read just a few moments ago in Exodus chapter six. Verse four is the key verse that we're looking at. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage wherein they were strangers. This is a landed covenant. It deals with real real estate. It deals with something God promised to Israel as a nation, to those who are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not merely the descendants of Abraham, for Abraham had other sons also. He had a son by Hagar. He had a son by Keturah and others, and more wives in addition than concubines. It's a specific land grant to a specific lineage, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So far, we've learned 17 things about this covenant. We got through five more last week. We'd seen about 12 up to that point. Let me quickly remind you of those 17 things. The covenant of the land sets the conditions by which national Israel entered the promised land the first time. Number two, it set the conditions for Israel to remain in the land. Number three, it set the conditions necessary to ultimately inherit the entire scope of the land from the Euphrates River on the east to the Nile River on the west. Number four, the covenant says that the land is an everlasting possession. Number five, it guarantees that when Israel is expelled because of sin, God holds the land in escrow for them until he irresistibly draws them back to the land. Number six, it guarantees that God will bring them back because Jehovah's covenants with Israel cannot be broken. Number seven, the covenant of the land is an unconditional promise that therefore guarantees that Israel will be a nation forever. Number eight, the covenant of the land guarantees that the fulfillment ultimately is totally unconditional. It will be their land forever. Number nine, it is a prophetic covenant. Number ten, God always fulfills prophecy literally, specifically, naturally, visibly, and physically. Number eleven, because future promises to Israel are prophetic, Denial of the literal interpretation of prophecy is an attack on the inspiration of scripture. Number 12, believing prophetic truth results in holy living. And that's why you see so much immorality in the apostate churches who no longer believe that God has promises for national Israel. Prophetic truth, believing it, really believing it in your heart, will result in a holy life. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope, that is the hope of the imminent return of Christ, every man that hath this hope in him, purifieth himself, even as he is pure. 1 John 3, 2 and 3. Number 13. 
Israel would be cast out of the land because of sin. That has occurred three times with two restorations that we've studied thus far. Number 14, Israel will be fully restored to the land upon repentance. Partial repentance and partial restoration has occurred, and so we see a partial, rest partial restoration currently in progress in the land. Number 15, repentance must come before Messiah sets up his millennial kingdom. And we looked last week and saw that that was the essence of the message of John the Baptist. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was calling national Israel to repentance. He was the forerunner of Christ. He was calling national Israel to repentance because Christ would offer the kingdom to Israel. Matthew 3, verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he which is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And by the way, there in Isaiah, that's Jehovah, Yahweh. Prepare the way of Jehovah. He is preparing the way for Jesus. Jesus is Jehovah. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Number 16. Repentance before the kingdom was also the message of Jesus after Herod arrested John and killed him. Jesus picked up that same message, Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and angels ministered unto him. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. The good news that the kingdom is coming. Preparing the way for the kingdom, that's what John did. And now Jesus picks up the same message. And what does he preach? preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. He picked up the same message that John the Baptist had. Repentance must come to Israel as a nation before they can enter into the millennial promises that God gave all over the Old Testament. Number 17. Repentance before the kingdom was also the message Jesus told the disciples to preach. When he sent them out, this is the message that they were to preach. Mark 6, verse 7, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats, and he said unto them, In whatsoever place ye enter into an house, there abide ye till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust out of your, under your feet, for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And so what did he tell them to preach? Next verse. He describes what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to walk by faith, how they're not supposed to be relying on all their own personal resources, and what's the message he gives them? Verse 12, and they went out and preached that men should repent. Same message. John preached it. You've got to repent before the kingdom can come. Preached it to the Jewish nation. Number two, Jesus preached to the Jewish nation. You must repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You can't get in without repentance. Number three, Jesus told the disciples, go out and preach. They've got to repent because the kingdom is at hand. Jesus offered the kingdom to Israel. That, by the way, is one of the main themes of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew is the Gospel written specifically for the Jews. It has all kinds of special indicators in it that a Jewish reader who knew his Old Testament would pick up on. Repent, because you can't get into the kingdom until you come to repentance as a nation. Repentance before the kingdom was the message the disciples preached also. And then we saw one more passage out of the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, where Jesus is also teaching them a special lesson about repentance. It's not the other guy that needs to repent, it's you that needs to repent. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. Yeah, you're looking at them saying, boy, they must have really been bad guys. 
Look at what happened to them. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Jesus is here answering that very wrongly worded question, why do bad things happen to good people? According to Jesus, there are no good people. We are all bad. We live in a fallen world. We experience the results of the fall, including natural and man-made disasters and catastrophes. Repentance and faith in Christ is the only way to avoid the eternal consequences of being fallen people in a fallen creation. And remember that call to repentance came before Jesus called his disciples and then the disciples preached that same message also. That brings us now to lesson number 18. The message of repentance is the key to the covenant of the land. Let me say it again. Lesson 18, the message of repentance is the key to the covenant of the land, which is God's promise to national Israel. And God is going to guarantee that they come to repentance. The way that God will do that is through what's been called the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble or the time of Jacob's sorrow, to bring national Israel to repentance. Deuteronomy chapter 30. It shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. The scattering of the Jews has been no accident. It was the hand of God in chastening, driving them out of their land, which he has held in escrow for them, but driving them out of their land so that they would see what it's like living in the rest of the world. They lived in the land and they wanted to live like the rest of the world. They had all the idols of the world. They went after the same things of the world. They had the same lusts in their hearts. God says, if you want to live like the world, then I'm going to drive you out there and let you see what the world is really like. Be careful, people. He does that to Christians, too. You want to live like the world? Then maybe God will turn you over to the world. Turn you over to your own lusts, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1. He scattered them around the world and they're going to be out there. And he says, when you'll call to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee and shalt return unto the Lord thy God. What is that? That's repentance. They've been going one way and they go the other way. They've turned back now to the Lord thy God and shalt obey his voice. It's not merely a mental exercise. It's an understanding that I've been going after false gods and I am now going to obey the voice of the Lord. Not just realize, yeah, you know, that's, that's correct theology. Listen, if your theology doesn't change your life, you have a vain and empty theology. True doctrine, believed with all the heart, will change your life. It has to. What you believe affects and affects what you do. Do you really believe it? If you believe, how, as you know my question, how has it changed your life? Your people. If you merely sit here and play church on Sunday and the rest of the week live like the rest of the world, you have not faith. Genuine faith in Jesus Christ causes you to understand that he died for your sins. So how shall you any longer live therein? Well, back to preaching instead of meddling. Thou shalt return to the Lord thy God, that's repentance, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. It's not partial. It's not haphazard. It's not of I'll take it or leave it, or when I get around to it, or when I feel like it, 
with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then, and it's not going to happen until then, when Israel as a nation turns with all her heart and with all her soul, then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whether the Lord thy God has scattered thee. Lesson number 19. Lesson number 19. The fact that God will use the great tribulation to bring Israel to repentance is restated in the New Testament both in the Gospels and the epistles of Paul. Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately, get this word, after. Immediately, not some long time after. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is not the rapture. The rapture of the whole earth doesn't see Christ coming back. When Jesus comes back to catch up his church, we meet him in the clouds. He doesn't come back and touch down on Mount Zion, as the book of Zechariah chapter 14 prophesies he will do at the second coming. They are two distinct, different events. One event, the Christians disappear from earth. And the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit is removed, according to Paul and Thessalonians. At that moment, all that is held back evil in the hearts of all men everywhere all that has held back evil in government, all that has held back evil in the criminal element of society, all that has held back evil is suddenly removed. And men begin to go about doing the very worst things that the human heart can imagine without restraint. That's when the Antichrist rises up and says, I can bring order to society once again. He does it supernaturally, but with the power of the devil. And that's the period of time when Israel enters the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of Jacob's sorrow. God uses that to chasten the nation he loves. We'll talk about chastening and God's work being done in the tribulation in a few moments, the Lord willing. But we're gone. We're at the wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven. We're rejoicing in the presence of the Savior. We're going before the Bema seat of Christ to receive the rewards for the things done in this body. Will it be wood, hay, or stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stone, as the Apostle Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 5. People, God is going to use the Great Tribulation to bring stiff-necked, he called them that, proud Israel, to repentance. Romans 11:25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part, those are very important little words, in part. There are Jews being saved today, but as a nation, they have not yet turned. Blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so shall, get this, all Israel shall be saved. Romans 11, 26. This is New Testament. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. The church is not Israel. The church is not Zion. The church is not Jacob. The day is coming when Christ will redeem Israel as a nation. And so shall all Israel be saved. That promise is quoted from Isaiah 59. Paul's not just making it up and so somebody could say, well, it's got to be the church because Paul writes about the church. That's a quotation from Isaiah 59, verses 20 and 21. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression to Jacob, in, in Jacob. That's, by the way, repentance. Turning from transgression is repentance. 
saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them. What have we been talking about? We've been talking about God's covenants with Israel. Saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. There is always a remnant. There is always a remnant in Israel. God guaranteed that. As you look at the Old Testament, you see that over and 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 over again. There's always a remnant. There's a cycle of judgment. You see that in the book of Judges. But there's always a remnant. Elijah thought he was all alone. Lord, I alone am left. Quit belly aching, Elijah. I still have 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. There is always a remnant that God makes sure and keeps that promise alive. There is coming a day not when all Israel merely will be saved, but all Judah will be saved. Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved. Remember, there was a divided kingdom in the days of Rehoboam, son of Solomon. Solomon wise, Rehoboam a fool. And so the kingdom divided, and Jeroboam took the northern ten tribes, and Rehoboam was left the southern two tribes. Not just Israel, but to make sure you don't miss it, Judah. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called Yahweh Tzitkenu, the Lord of Righteousness. That's Jesus, people. That's the Messiah. Back now to Romans chapter 11, verse 27. Notice the very next verse from what we just read. The, the, the deliverance is going to come out of Zion. He's going to turn away ungodliness for Jacob. Verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them. Unto them. Not unto the church. My covenant unto them. When I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election... They are beloved for the father's sakes. The fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. <laughs> Interesting, we've been talking about repentance, haven't we? You know, God doesn't need to change his attitude toward man. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God doesn't need to change his attitudes toward man. Man needs to change his attitude toward God. Israel, as a nation, is one of the key illustrations of two things. Number one, it's a key illustration of election. Number two, it is a key illustration of chastening of the elect in the scripture. God deals with Israel as an elect group. God gives visible illustration to us by the way he deals with Israel as to how he deals with his elect individuals. You know, in the past we've seen that Paul specifically says that the history of Israel happened to them as an illustration to teach us, and that's the reason we study the Old Testament even though we're not under the law. 1 Corinthians 10, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All did eat the same spiritual meat, all did drink that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So what are we supposed to learn from this? God did all these five great things for every one of them. But with some of them God wasn't well pleased. Well, that's a real understatement. Two guys made it. Joshua and Caleb. With some of them, God was not well pleased. The rest of them died in the wilderness. Joshua and Caleb made it through. And the children. Why? Verse 6. Now these things were our examples. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things. As they also lusted. Verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest 
he fall. Dear people, the way God dealt with Israel is an example of how God will deal with those who are his people who rebel against him, who disobey him, who sin against him, who walk in the flesh, who walk in the ways of the world, who tra travel after false gods instead of following the true God with all their heart and all their soul and all their mind. What happened to Israel? You can learn from that. You can also learn from the fact that God has unconditional covenants with Israel that he will keep because he will bring them back just like he brings you back. The shepherd goes after his sheep. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Dear people, do you study your Old Testament and do you tremble when you see what God did with Israel? I hope so. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. The repentance of Israel as a nation is the primary promise that Paul appeals to in Romans 11 to prove the elective purposes of God. Paul says that God sovereignly ordained the temporary, get that, temporary, he sovereignly ordained the temporary fall of Israel so that he could open the door for the Gentiles to be saved. If he had not ordained the temporary fall of Israel, you and I would still probably be running around in loincloths chucking spears somewhere. We would have never have heard the gospel. Or if it had come through, we'd probably have killed the missionary. Romans chapter 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles. That's why we are here today. God is going to bring them back. They're a stubborn, rebellious, stiff-necked people. But God says, I've set my love upon them. And I am going to bring them back. I may have to chasten them very, very severely to do it. But I will bring them back. But meanwhile, because they have broken communion with me, I'm going to open the door for you. And Paul goes on, he says, don't be proud about it, don't boast about it, because if God cut off the natural branches, which can be regrafted into that root, and then he grafted you in, and you're not a natural branch, you're a wild olive branch, God can certainly graft them back in. So don't be so haughty and puffy, because God can cut you off too for sin. Not loss of salvation, but come under severe chastening. You see the chastening Israel has gone through? Chastening that's lasted 2,000 years now. Do you think God could do that to you? And to your children? And to your grandchildren? And to your great-grandchildren? And you think how many generations that takes you to get down to 2,000 years? Could he do it? You know he could do it. Be not high-minded, but fear, says the word of God. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is by wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Notice well what that passage says. You've heard me say this before. You'll hear me say it again probably many times if the Lord tarries, gives me life, and lets us all gather together to worship. That church, the church does not replace Israel. That's not what the passage said. The church does not become Israel. That's not what the passage said. The church is merely grafted into the root. And Israel as a nation is going to be regrafted into the root as a nation when it repents. The church and Israel are separate branches grafted into the same root of the Messiah. Romans 11:26. So all Israel shall be saved, as is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away in godliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. 
not talking to the Romans about taking away our sins, not talking to that group of Gentiles that lived in Italy about our sins. He was talking about God's going to come and there'll be a day when he takes away their sins and they'll be regrafted back into the same root. That brings us to lesson number 20. When? When will national repentance occur? For Israel, when will national repentance occur? Israel's national repentance and salvation will come at the end of the greatest period of chastening that Israel as a nation has ever known. They've gone through some bad stuff. I mean, if you know anything about history, you know the story of the wandering Jew. You know the story of the Holocaust. You know the story of the pogroms. You know that not pilgrims, pogroms, P-O-G-R-O-M-S. You know the story of all the harassment that the Jews have experienced in every land where they have gone. And they have been everywhere. Not long ago, I got a magazine from the University of Chicago. That's where my mother-in-law got her master's degree. And when she was living with us, she got all of her mailings from the University of Chicago. And uh, they have lots and lots of very interesting articles in them of all kinds of archaeology and all kinds of things that their professors are doing research on and so on. And one of the articles was about the Jews in China and the synagogues in China. And how they had gone over and they had done all this study over there and they still have their Torah scrolls. They've still got them in Hebrew. Uh, they've got the menorahs, you know, carved in on the walls. And it's in China. Then they've been there for hundreds of years. God said he would scatter them to all the nations of the earth. And there they are. But the greatest period of chastening that Israel has ever known is the seven-year Great Tribulation. During the final three days, the scripture prophesies it, we'll read it in a second, during the final three days of the Great Tribulation period, Israel as a nation is going to repent. Now they're already back there as a political nation, they're already back there as a political entity, but they're not back there with their temple built and with the worship of the true God going on in Jerusalem. In fact, many of them are secular Jews who do not believe. Many are Orthodox Jews who are running around doing all kinds of odd little 613 extra things to make the hedge about the law to make sure they don't break the Ten Commandments. But they're not back there in faith yet. It's going to happen in the last three days. Listen, this is out of the book of Hosea. How many of you know what the book of Hosea is about? God tells Hosea to marry Gomer. And he tells him in advance, she's not going to be faithful to you. And when Hosea's first child is born, he thinks it's his. Second child, he's not so sure. Third child, he knows it's not his. And then Hosea, then Gomer runs away. She's committing all kinds of immorality. And finally, she's getting sold on a slave market. And Hosea buys her back off the slave market. And God says, I'm giving you an illustration of what Israel is like. I'm giving you an illustration of how I chose my wife. How I chose Israel to be the wife of Jehovah. And how she has committed fornication and adultery with all the pagan gods. And she's run after everything except me, the one who is her husband. Now he's going to talk about Israel when she gets brought back to him. Hosea chapter 6. Here's what the nation will say. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, in the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning. Does that ring any bells? I hope it does. Remember the last words of David? 
as David was dying and he talks about the Messiah coming down as dew upon the tender grass is going forth is prepared as the morning he shall come unto us as the rain as the latter and former rain unto the earth that which gives the refreshment after our time of drought after two days and then on the third day and Israel's going to see him and they're going to mourn for him Zechariah as one mourns for his only son they're going to recognize the Messiah and they will cry out for his deliverance and he will deliver them he's torn them but he will heal them he has smitten them but he will bind them their proud independent spirit will finally be broken when they see that they have no hope in the flesh no hope in their military genius no hope in their technical skills no hope in their incredible culture and talents and abilities and God has given an immense amount of that to the Jews no hope in their grit and determination no hope in their wealth and possessions and ability to blend in they will have no place to turn no place to hide their only option left is to turn to the Messiah and cry out for his deliverance You well know that today Israel relies on their Iron Dome, the missile defense system over Jerusalem, the Israeli Defense Force, the IDF, the Mossad, their secret spy service like our CIA, their banking skills, their Jewish donations from around the world, their creative inventiveness, their human strength, their skill, they rely on that today. But at the end of the time of Jacob's sorrow, all of that is going to be taken away there will be no hope and all they have left will be turning to the Messiah only the Messiah will be left and he will deliver them when they cry out to him because he has promised it remember what we just said in the scripture Israel is a nation is one of the key illustrations of election and number two Israel is an illustration of God's promise to chasten the elect because he loves them well our time is up we'll have to talk about why God has chastened Israel and why God chastens us next week our gracious Heavenly Father how we thank you for your word and for its power your promises are true your promises are yea and amen Israel's given to us as an illustration of how you as a loving God keeps promise keeps covenant you are loyal you are faithful you have a loyal love which you have placed upon your people and it is a love that never fails no matter what we go through here below as you refine us as you bring us through the fire to remove the dross that you might present us as pure gold to reflect the image of your son Jesus Christ Father we pray that you'll take that which we have studied today that you'll encourage our hearts to know that there is a living God a God who is personally and intimately concerned and cares about each and every one of us for we see it in the way that you have cared for Israel the point to which you have brought them now and the guaranteed promises that are yet to come bless your word to our hearts and to the way in which we live our lives for we pray it in Jesus name Amen <laughs>